someone had just said, um, I can't wait for your church to rethink your sexual ethics. Mm. And I was like, hey, with all due respect, you think I haven't thought this through? <laughs> you think I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs? You think when you drop something that you saw on a YouTube video about um, the word homosexual not being in the Bible, it, it, like the, I've never, oh my gosh, I've never heard that. I've never heard that. So again, I think there's, a, there's an assumption of your ignorance. Um, but the, 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 they're not saying that because they're ignorant. They're saying it because they've just learned it and it's exciting mm. for them and they want to test that. They're saying that because they care about people and they're worried that people who are not thoughtful are holding on to positions that are harmful for others. So, you know, it's um, um, in secularism, there is no higher good than human flourishing. And so I think a lot of gen, the way secularism shows up in Gen Z is that the ultimate good is human flourishing. Mm. And so if somebody say like you're, you're harming someone with that idea, um, that's like the ultimate trump card. Your position does harm. And um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, eudaimonia. This is like, Human flourishing is the highest good of life, and self-actualization is the point of existence. And um, it's that's a lot better than hedonism, man. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the kingdom of Jesus. There's something above human flourishing, which is the glory of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And so, I think I, I I don't think we've done a good enough job teaching Gen Z about the kingdom of God. If they're meant, to, listen, I would say this: if if they're meant to be seeking this first, we owe them to tell them what it is that they're meant to be seeking. And I do not feel like we have done that. I feel like we've shown them a shallow version of modern church. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I'm so glad you joined us today. And hey, if you're here for the first time, make sure you subscribe. We bring you incredible guests here, guests like Seth Godin, Adam Grant, uh, James Clear, Susan Cain, Craig Groeschel, Andy Stanley, and a whole lot more. And today we're bringing you John Tyson. We're going to have a conversation about a cultural obsession with identity, what's changing in the generations, and a whole lot more. And today's episode is brought to you by the Church Network. You know, church leaders, we're running in a race that's a marathon, not a sprint. Don't go it alone. You can join the Church Network Conference July 9th through 12th in Lexington, Kentucky. You can simply register today at the churchnetwork.com slash 2024 conference and make sure you check out church.tech. So imagine uploading your Sunday message to YouTube and with a click of a button, all of a sudden in a minute, you've got small group guides, devotions, social media content, a whole lot more done for you in 60 seconds. Yeah, that happens and it's good. You can visit church.tech to get started. Use the code Carrie at checkout. That's C-A-R-E-Y. And now to today's conversation with John Tyson. John, just thrilled to have you back. Welcome. Thank you so much, mate. Always a joy talking with you. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you are swimming in right now? It's a different city, New York City, than it was, say, five years ago. Uh, I think we'll all, we're all agreeing that we're moving into some kind of a different era. What are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you experiencing? I tell you, I, I, I've been in a, a series of meetings this past week, and one of the things that people talk about a lot that I have felt and observed is generational differences in the church. I mean, I've, I've felt it. I, it's almost like walking into a wall in terms of values and preferences and understandings. And, you know, people have talked about that. I've talked about that before, but like watching it happen, giving Gen Z folks more space at the table, not just to be there, but to shape, to speak in, giving them confidence to say what they really think, those sorts of things. It leads to some confrontations. And hmm. some misunderstanding, and uh, so I've I've noticed that that's been a huge thing. I think I'm seeing the increase of secularism, not as a academic ideology, but as a functional way that people navigate reality and live, creating identities and building their world without even a thought of God as a reference point in any of it. That has normalized so quickly. And it has cemented in ways that have been very, very surprising to me. 
And uh, I'd say another big theme would just be suspicion of authority in general, um, but a hyper suspicion of spiritual authority. All so, right. yeah, it's an inter- interesting time to lead. Well, there's the agenda for an hour. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is really good. I'd like to pick up on number two, because you lead in the same city Tim Keller led in for decades. Yep. Yeah. And, I mean, I talk about Keller a lot. I think about him a lot. He's been a profound influence on me. One of the yeah. things Keller said, uh, Tim said, in an interview I did with him in 2020, was that if he was starting over again in New York, he would talk about identity. Because he noticed, even since 1989, when he and Kathy first came to the city, he said, then it was kind of success, and this isn't your mother's church, and then it went into, uh, you know, work is my identity, or whatever, or, um, you know, some kind of apologetics. I'm not doing him justice on this. But he said, if I was starting over again, identity has become so huge, not just sexual identity, but with the demise of the church, people are looking to attach their identity to something else. What are you seeing? You mentioned identity. Are you seeing something different? Are you seeing an extrapolation? What are you noticing about identity and the role it's playing in secularism? Well, what what Tim said, and these are all just paraphrases, not exact quotes, Yeah, was the essence of sin and how sin maps itself out in secularism is not any particular moral violation. It's not, uh uh-huh, you you know, it's not the breaking of rules as such. It is the construction of an identity without any reference point towards God. So in Romans chapter 1, when Paul's going to map out to the great city of Rome, I mean, you imagine writing a letter to Christians in the city of Rome. You think, if you've ever been to Rome, you think about the Palatine Hill, you think about all the temples, you think about the military, you think about the sports, you think about all the nations. It's a huge, huge city. And um, Paul starts by saying, they did not acknowledge him as God or give him thanks. So all worship is rooted in a sense of, I recognize I'm created and dependent, and therefore my response is gratitude and worship, compared to idolatry, which says, I am self-defining and entitled. I'm, I've made myself, and I have obligations to nobody beyond myself. That's the essence of how modern people, I think, in, mi- in many ways that we're talking about, form their identity. N- the sin is that there's not a reference point towards God. So the thought that, you, that, that there is an, a way you should have to live, that you cannot have identity options as a blank slate for self-expression, that just sounds like cultural heresy. And uh, so I see a lot of people who absolutely live their life by self-definition without reference point to the Creator. So, for example, we're now playing the role of the Creator. Jesus says in Matthew 19, it's the, it, have you not read the Creator made the male and female? Now in the modern world, we're saying, I am the Creator. I can make myself male or female. There's, there's no reference point to any sort of divine design, blowing of distinctions and boundaries. Um, I think, yeah, Philip Reef, uh, who's obviously been mentioned on your podcast before, he talks about culture and anti-culture, and anti-culture is the annihilation and hunting down of any settled convictions. Hmm. Culture is organizing chaos for flourishing, and anti-culture is hunting down boundaries and convictions and destroying them. And I think that's what we're seeing with identity. There's no ordering the raw elements of life under some divine vision. It's just radical self-expression based on whatever economic, sexual, political, even theological categories that you want. So so that's, I mean, I think we all know that, but how that makes that hard is to tell one of these people, I have good news for you. There's a way you're supposed to be and you have to change. And for a lot of people, that does not come across as good news. That comes across as oppressive, restrictive, harsh, controlling, bigoted. And uh, yeah. so... I think it was Lyotard who said, post-modernism, postmodernism is a suspicion of meta-narratives. And I think there is an acute suspicion of anybody who tells you how to live your life. So well, yeah, I mean, that is, that is happening a lot, yeah. Yeah, yes and no. I'm not disagreeing with you, but yep. the idea that, okay, we're all opposed to meta-narratives, but I think you you raise a really good point. We're all creating our own meta-narratives. So if my identity isn't in work, it might be in my sexuality. It might be in um, 
you know, my status. It might be in um, my politics. It could be in, you know, this label. It's funny. We live in a very anti-label culture, except we all want to label ourselves. And we want to say, I am fill in the blank. It's like this push pull, this yin and yang. What, what are you noticing in the people that you're actually interacting with in New York city, which in many ways is a cultural harbinger for everything that is to come in America down the road. And I know a lot of people in the South would say, no, it's not. It's like, well, just look at what was happening in New York 20 years ago. Look at what's happening in the nation. Now you'll see some parallels. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, there would be some some universals that what happens in New York does get distributed to other places. I think in some sense, shared media consumption has... has um, New York has lost its global importance mm. uh, in some areas because everybody's looking at the same YouTube videos and whatever's going viral. So there's definitely a great flattening, locational flattening, uh, that social media has done for us, which has staggering implications. Mm. But there will always be a local reality to where you live. I think one thing that you know maybe you see on the news um, that that I feel acutely are the migrants who are here in New York City. We've got 180,000 migrants who've come here in the last 18 months, two years. You, you think about, um, I don't know if you're still in Canada, but I I, like there's, there's, there isn't hundreds of cities over 180,000 people in Canada. No. And uh, maybe even in the US, there's not. So they just, you had 180,000 people that the city is in many ways paying for. Um trying to integrate and build new lives here. Mm. And um, that is causing a lot of chaos. The systems are not designed to support that many people. There's a lot of heartbreak, a lot of terrible stories, a lot of pain, a lot of controversy. That That is a real factor. Um, I mean, that that affected my life this morning at 6 a.m. I mean, that is How a... So? That, well, you, you're just, you're talking to people, you're meeting people, you're seeing people on the streets you know, um, there's whole families asking for money, sitting there begging, you know. Um, there's other folks who are being horrifically discriminated against in the workplace because they have very little agency to defend themselves. There's a lot of exploitive labor and work conditions, incredible economic challenges. And church, you know, what role does the church play in that? Many of these folks don't speak English. And so you're trying to offer support. And um, anyway, that, so that's something that I don't think when people think New York City, Manhattan, they're thinking that. And I think that's something that we would think and pray about a lot. I think another one people are sort of thinking through is AI. Mm -hmm. New York is a creative industry. Um, What it's doing for content in terms of writing, even art, um, automation, a lot of those things. I think there's, I think a lot of New Yorkers are thinking about what are the implications of that. Cost of living, I mean, it's just stupidly prohibitive. Almost I mean, everywhere, but especially in New York. Yeah, it's, it's sort of at that point where it's like, can you build a life here long term? Probably not. Not for most people. You've got to be really successful. And often that success is going to put you through a gauntlet of about a decade where your schedule's choked out. And uh, so, yeah, I think I see that uh, as something. But I think a lot of people would say it's the best and worst of times in New York. It's, it's ama- it feels amazing. You know, I was out on the street on Ninth Avenue right before I came up here. Sun shining. It's a beautiful winter day. It's clear. People are walking around. A lot of joy. So, yeah, I think, I, I think New York is leaning into the, the realities of, you know, technology and immigration and the economy, economy, not at meta levels, but on very, very personal and profound levels. So these big news headlines, we feel those on a very, very personal level around us quite a bit. So how has that changed or altered your approach to ministry over the last few years? Well, honestly, it's a real tension with us. Mm. Um, we don't own any facilities. I've been here 19 years. Pack up, tear down. Four services on a Sunday. We have three venues as a church. And um, no matter how you gamify it or talk about Jesus taking off his outer robe and washing people's feet and having a servant's heart, 19 years of doing the same stuff in a city like New York where you can't even park properly. 
is frustrating. So we we don't we don't control uh, some, m- most of our leases. So we can't serve the poor. We can't bring like our offices where I am right now. I'm in Hell's Kitchen. We can't. Br- the security guards at the front desk. We can't bring the poor in and care for them and offer services. So a lot of our stuff has been through partnerships. You know, I think we've had a more external focus on partnerships. Mm-hmm. How do we empower uh, other churches? How do we give resources to other churches? We've increased our giving to people we think are serving the city well. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's it's an outward focus and it's an inner frustration is probably what I feel. Our church has grown a lot since COVID. So we feel growth strains. We've got all the system strains. In many ways, we're in an Act 6 moment. You know, a lot of like, whose job is it to do what? Good growth problems. But all of that put together uh, does make for some some challenging leadership. You started off with generational differences. So yeah. what are you noticing and what kind of tension is that creating around your table or tables? I think a big one... Um, so number one, I want to say, I feel torn on both sides. I'm 47. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm an old 47 man, not a young 47. <laughs> what uh, does that mean? What do you mean? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just got a lot of mileage on this model. Uh-huh. Um, so it would be some examples. Some of our older folks sort of can't believe the way they're talked to. So there's just there's just no assumption of cultural respect. There's no... You think you deserve something because you've been breathing air a few years longer than me? Now, no one would say that, but, you know, I mean, uh, an example would be when I get done preaching some of the things that people say to me. It's just like, hey, you you don't have, you believe you have a full right to say whatever you want to any person in the world without any filter. And, um, you know, I don't, you know, take that to heart that often. I want to engage, you know, I want to give a warm welcome and make people remember how non-defensive and open I was. But I think those interpersonal things are very, very real. Um, the amount of technology jokes people make about me is staggering. <laughs> like, um, hey, John, you know, they make Facebook ads. Hey, you on Facebook this morning? You know, I'm not on TikTok and I think I'm cool on Instagram. They're like, I'm just realizing and I think other folks are realizing the we are not the edge. Mm. Now, here's why that's hard. I Our church has never had more influence or momentum than this moment. And so you can, you can build a world at my age where you feel like you're the center of it. Mm-hmm. But if only you could realize the center of your world is on the side of the stage of history. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And so you've got to you've got to lean into the future because the future is here more than we already know. It's the classic. You were one of the first people I heard point this out. Um, everybody was talking about reaching millennials, and you're like, millennials drive minivans and have kids. You got to go after <laughs> yeah. Gen Z. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like that. Yeah. The future is more present than we're aware of, but we're still mm. building for the past, even by a few years. And I think I definitely feel that around the table. Another thing I feel around the table um, is lack of biblical worldview. Not even biblical knowledge. A lot of people listen to podcasts and Bible apps. There's a lot of, lot of Bible input, but there's not a lot of discernment. And so there's a lot of a lot of younger folks who um, have not been taught properly how to think in a godly way about all of reality, and I think there's a lot of secularism in their worldview. Yeah, Boy, not you're coming fault. up. Yeah, coming up with some pretty dense sentences here, packed with meaning, John. So I'd like to drill down a little bit further. First of all, just an observation about your 40s. Thanks for going there. A lot of people who are in the senior pastor chair are in that space right now. And I've got a decade on you. I'll be 50. Well, a decade and a bit. I'll be 59 by the time this comes out. You look like you've got less mileage on you than me, mate. So congratulations. Well, I'm fighting with the sun here in my studio (laughs) that is in between lighting and renovation. So again, tech jokes. But it's really interesting. I think... I think your 40s is a really awkward decade. I remember being 42 and that was the last time. I don't know why this stuck out. It just hit me when I was 42. Nobody's calling me a young leader anymore. Happened till I was 41 and you're not being seen and you're not quite a sage or an elder of the village as Bob Goff would say or that kind of thing yet. You know, by the time you're almost out of your 50s, people look at you differently. 
And yeah. there's a little more grace there, perhaps. But it's a very yeah. awkward teenager phase of adult yeah. life. A, it is. It's kind of a second adolescence. It is like a second adolescence. Yeah. I think yeah. that's why you see marriages blow apart. That's why you see people yeah. have affairs, because your your youth is stealing away, but your wisdom years are just getting started, theoretically. Oh, mate, we could do a whole podcast on midlife. I've just done a huge... I've got a course um, that I do at Pastor's events called Ministry in Midlife because there's almost no theology of ministry for middle-aged people. And wow. a lot of the crises happening in ministry are being called spiritual warfare, cultural change, lack of accountability. And really, it's the leader's internal life not having the tools needed to make it into the second half of life. But oh, it's, wow. that's a, that's a, it's a different issue, but it's certainly a very, very prevalent one. Interesting. What are some top insights from that course about midlife? Well, if, if you have a proper midlife crisis, it should feel as awkward as your teenage years. Yeah. It, it, it is a second adolescence. The first half is really about um, accomplishment and success. It's, it's called heroic thinking. In your 20s, you're like, why did the generation before tolerate this, do this, I'll show them. And then when you get a little older into your True. 30s, you know, like, why do my parents have such a bad marriage? How could, why don't they just love each other and work it out? And then in, in, towards your late 30s, you're like, wow, it's really hard to accept another person as they are and not try and change them. <laughs> wow, I actually think I may be the one that needs to change. So you shift from heroic thinking um, mm. to, to the second half of life, which is really defined by meaning and wonder. So I, I listen, Similar to you, there's very, very few worldly accomplishments I'm interested in. You know, you speak at enough stuff, you, you, you're just kind of like, hey, look, there's not, there's not a conference on earth right now if I got to speak at it. It would probably move my heart. I try to do it to serve Jesus, but I'm not chasing those sorts of things. I realize life is hard. What I'm chasing is meaning. Who am I really? Not who do I wish I was. Find joy and accept that. And then wonder. Life beats the, the, the stuffing out of you. And it's very easy to get cynical and lose vision and joy. And so it's a quest to re-enchant your heart. But to do that in midlife in a mature way is more than hobbies and great vacations. It is a real sense of uh, trying to find God in the world in a new way. And uh, anyway, so yeah, there's, a lot, there's not a lot of tools for that in ministry, under the pressures True. of ministry. So yeah. Yeah, and bigger and better does lose its luster, doesn't it? really does. It just starts to fade. You're just not as motivated. I was thinking about that. I was recalibrating my personal schedule earlier yeah. this week. I've, I've got an episode with Cal Newport that'll be out sometime okay. this yep. year where I kind of had him consult with me live. <laughs> and okay. I'd just done it the nice. day before. Yeah. And I want to spend the first two hours, and I'm so early stages into this, this could all blow up by the time I'm this broadcast. But yeah, I, I thought, I want to live like our mutual friend, John Mark Comer, your good friend. I want to live yeah. with my devices off for the first few hours of the day. And the digital Bible was getting in the way of that because I use version like half a yep. billion other people do, <laughs> you know. And then, but it was so tempting for me. I'll just check social. I'll just see who texted me. I'll just, and so I literally grabbed my analog Bible off the shelf, printed out my prayer schedule, printed out uh, my Bible, my one-year Bible reading plan in very small font so that I just now look it up yeah. analog style and just start going with that. Mm -hmm. And the first two hours of the day are devoted to zero productivity and a lot of deep thinking and creating. So I'm working on a project right now that may or may not see daylight, but a few days into it, it's just so refreshing. And it's like, I don't know if this will be a book. I don't know whether it'll be a documentary. I don't know whether any will be interested. I don't know whether I'm going to mm. go after a publishing deal or whether I'm going to do it myself. I don't care. I just want to do the work. And hopefully in service of church leaders who are listening one day, and if it takes me two years, it takes me two years. That's fine. Uh, that is so refreshingly liberating. And a younger driven me would have been like, gotta ship by Christmas. It's like, hey, something yeah. <laughs> will ship, you know, but... Sure. I don't know. Do you feel some of those changes happening? Well, you know you? what's so interesting? What? So you, I, I think one of the things you would said maybe we'd touch on is like, you know, like what have you done to cultivate resiliency? It's interesting you said two yeah. hours because I have found for about 
23 years of my life that it takes me about two hours in the morning to be the man I want to be in the day. Oh. And that two hours is, I've got a little template. I, listen, man, I'm, I'm an I'm a uh-huh. organized guy, but I've got a little template like, here's my perfect day, here's my perfect day, here's mm-hmm. my perfect week, broken down into perfect morning, perfect afternoon, perfect evening. And my perfect morning takes me two hours to get through. And it's so different mm-hmm. than what people think. It's looking at photography. It's reading poetry. It's reading um, a Pente- Smith Wigglesworth daily devotional, so I get a little dose of Pentecostal faith. It's reading uh, John Frame's uh, uh, small theology, so I'm getting, you know, I'm really understanding who God is. It's lectio divina. Mm. It's slow thought. It's receiving the Father's love. There's zero contending urgency, a sense of duty, and it's exactly like you were saying. It's often me standing there with coffee, sort of looking off into the horizon lost in thought. And so for, uh, people would say, where do you get time to do it? And I, was, I would say, I can't not do it. It's not even mm. a necessity for me. Like I can't live the life I'm called to live and the demands that are on my heart without having a well to draw on a daily basis. And it just, it just takes me about two hours to, to sort of run the script. That's just what it, just how long it takes. So that I don't is, know. If, it's not prescriptive. It's just an observation, but it's a, maybe there's something there. But you've got the craziness of like 19 years in rented facilities, growth challenges, all the usual stuff. You know, last time you were on, you were talking about your wife having long COVID, your whole family being sick. Like you've got the normal stuff, well, yes. and abnormal stuff of everyone yes. else. And it can be so tempting to hit the ground at pick your hour, five, six, seven a.m. and just run into it. But, you know, you're one of the, I don't want to say who it was, but I was texting with a guy who's becoming a friend. He's about 15 years younger than me, leads a very large ministry. And we were at an event together and he just said, you know, where are the, the Tim Kellers and the John Pipers of this generation? And it's a really great question to ask. And when I think about the future, and I've said this to you, I've said this to John Mark Comer, I've said this to a handful of other people. Um, I think doing that deep work, the combination of looking at photography that you really enjoy, because you know you do enjoy that, and Lectio Divina, and prayer, and leadership, hours a day, and reading widely. You've already quoted a couple of philosophers nobody listening to this has probably heard of, including me. Um, you know, like that actually over time, at 57, you'll have a decade more reps of that. At 67, you'll have even more. At 77, should we live yeah. so long, you'll have even more. And that's how wisdom is cultivated. That's why Eugene yes. Peterson yeah. was, you know, I was talking to somebody, well, I think this was public, John Mark Comer. Yeah, he did. This was on my podcast. And he was saying, you know, he went to see J- Eugene Peterson shortly before he died, a couple of years. And it was clear that his decline was in process. And he didn't say a single word that hadn't been published elsewhere, but it was like being in the presence of Christ. And I was on that trip. I was. In you that were room. on that trip. Okay, yes, tell us. Yes. Give us your slant. No, no. I mean, yeah. I mean, he definitely had some cognitive decline. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, it's. I've been around a lot of great leaders. He was the genuinely most sage-like in the truest archetypal sense of that word. He was a quiet content, half in eternity, half in the room, quiet, authoritative man. He had, it's just, he was liberated from a single thing to prove. And I mean, it was, it was a, it was a really, I mean, we, we took, yeah, we took time to debrief that. We we spent a day and a half, I don't know, I can't remember how long it was exactly. And then we spent two and a half days debriefing it because it was really kind of a jarring experience. Um, there's not a lot of men that are like that. And mm. uh, yeah, I think we have an obligation. I mean, I yeah, there's, a, there's a massive generational mantle transfer through death and ministry failure happening right now. And some of the guys getting it are not quite ready for it. And I've, I look around New York, I mean, gosh, man, there's not a, I feel like a young father. Mm. Now I've got adult children, you know, my, both my kids are in their 20s. 
But I look around and I'm like, at some point you've got to say, Lord, I'm not quite ready. But there's not, but I feel like I'm up a little bit. Now, again, I don't think the difference with someone like Piper and Keller is these men were raised pre-social media. So whatever fame they had, both of them had fame. Keller's mm-hmm. fame was uh, tape circulation, subscriptions to Redeemer's literal cassette tape ministry. Mm-hmm. And so that will draw your attention away, but only incidentally. And there was not, pod, there was not podcasts. There was not a publishing mecca like today. There's no social media. There's no blogging. So these men were formed in a, in a kind of deep contextual faithfulness that this generation has not, will not, cannot be formed in. So we have to, ca- we have a lot of catching up to sort of imitate the conditions of depth, stability, lack of external awareness that those folks have. That's how they were. I remember uh, talking with Keller and he, he said, and I just published my first book. And he was like, none of you have got anything to say until you turn 50. And I remember just going, oh, I was going to ask you to endorse Uh-oh. it. I just go and keep that to myself. <laughs> and he's just, was, and I was like, and I think he published Reason for God, like in his mid 50s. I think it was 57. And, that's yeah, a, I mean, that's uh, again, that I'm like, so shocking. Yeah. And I think he left it too late, just personally. Mm. Um, but he was, but when he arrived, he could, he could just hang at any level. And I think, I, I do agree. We've got to we've got to ask God for new spiritual fathers and mothers to come up. Um, but we're we're get our we are way more underformed and deformed than they were by the cultural mechanisms we have, particularly around pastoring. You know, it's several questions. It's hit me. You know, because I've i I would say being my stage. You know, born in nineteen sixty five. 10, 15 years ago, I would say, yeah, I have a pre-digital memory. But that's when I was like 38, 40. And now I'm saying it and I'm realizing there are 40-year-olds with no pre-digital memory. And I'm wondering if we are going to become the generation that dies off remembering the depression and nobody else remembers the depression, right? Or or the war or whatever it is. It's, it's interesting. It's a very, very important question, but there's a real tension there. There's a tension on forgetting the past out of a desire to be relevant. And you don't want to be relevant. You don't want to... I have negative desire to try and be a young, cool pastor. (laughs) Negative, negative desire. I never... If I tried to dress cool, my wife would say, what are you doing? Take why are you dressing like that? I basically wear a uniform and it is it is a non-observable, non-cool uniform. Um, so I don't want to be one of those older guys trying to be cool and relevant and keep up. But yeah. I also don't want to get stuck in the past. I mean, I've got a very mm-hmm. high appreciation for jazz music. Nothing will bring me more joy than going to, you know, Birdland is literally out that window. And man, mm. I would kill to just sneak over and get a 5.30 p.m. set, get one drink, sit at the bar and take in a show. I think that's cool and the next generation cares about that. And the vast majority, it's like talking about Bob Dylan. They're like, Bob who? I don't care about the war years. I don't care about peace in the 60s. It's irrelevant to me. It's very, very hard. So I was thinking this morning, I was watching in an elevator an older leader interacting with a younger leader. And this guy I thought was doing it really well. And he just sort of acknowledged that he wasn't a main feature in that person's audience. Hmm. He just sort of acknowledged, I got an older generation. Here's my demographic. I can't. I may not be the man to reach you. So I'm going to be really good at who I am. You know who I think's done this really well? Uh, Gordon McDonald. Oh, yeah. You know, he's just kind of like, hey, man, you can try and get teenagers to care about it, but I just don't think they will. It's, it's to their loss. Mm-hmm. But I think he's just kind of like, if you read his books, he would just sort of say, the older you get, the more you realize it's about relationships. You're living in the past. Your best days are not ahead. What's coming up is sickness and frailty. And yeah, heaven is, I guess. But so it's, it's tough to get that. So I, I, I guess the answer I would say is this. I'm trying to be timeless. I'm trying to be helpful. Mm. I'm not trying to be cool. I'm trying to be wise. I'm trying to be trusted. I'm trying to be stable. 
And if, if that helps younger folks and they feel like he feels like my dad a bit, but he feels like a young dad and I'm grateful for it. And older folks feel like maybe he's a young sage, man. He's emerging into a really thoughtful leader. I'm happy with that. But what I don't want to do is chase trends and try and be relevant and try and have the kids think I'm cool and give it, get, give it to someone who is cool and mentor them and love them and help them with their character and mature them. But anyway, you do here we are. You do TikTok. I'm I'm good. Yeah, right? Exactly. Like, right. I'll stay yeah. with uh, MySpace. <laughs> no, I think this is you know, and I think one of the reasons I'm thinking about pre digital memory, it's not just you know, I remember the 70s and 80s and the 90s. You know, it's not that. It's like literally for millennia, we have lived without digital tools, and culture keeps changing. But there's something I'm reading. I just started, so I'm hesitant to recommend it. But it's a really interesting. Uh, look at history, but uh, Mustafa Suleiman's The Come, the Coming Wave. Do you know that okay. book? Uh-uh. Uh, somebody recommended it to me and it's fantastic. He started DeepMind and okay. he's just writing about all the changes in history. Uh, last year I read Tom Holland's Dominion, uh-huh. uh, another really interesting retrospective. And you see the patterns. And I think we're at a hinge in history where those of us who do have a pre-digital memory perhaps have an interesting role as interlopers or interpreters to play in helping people make sense out of what really matters. Because I can't imagine getting my first device at two, you know, as an iPad babysitting me at a restaurant and, you know, having a smartphone in middle school where I had full command of the internet and everything Mm. else. Uh, That really does shape your world differently. Uh, so I want to ask you, okay, go ahead. Can I just say one thing? I think that's very interesting. When people say to me, Um, like, what do you love doing, John? Like, my favorite thing is between 20 to 50 people and four days, two days not enough, three days not enough, four days, that's when you get through that final layer of defense. Um, And just going deep with people. A, I cannot take deep human connection. And um, so, look, I'm not, I'm not worried that I'm going to run out of content. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, the, the worse AI gets, the better it gets for in-person discipleship. Oh. Now, I'm, I'm not anti-online discipleship. I love mm-hmm. it. There's never been a better opportunity to leverage technology, ever. But there's no threat. So if, you tr- if your job is being an internet celebrity, you're going to have a challenge yeah. for a crowded <laughs> market. But if your job is like, discipling people in person and loving them doing human community, these are the most beautiful days the church has almost ever had. It will only get better and better. So the future will be a dual response, Mm. but I'm very excited at my age to meet with people a few years either side of my life and just process becoming like Jesus together. Just being honest, going there, opening our hearts, getting below the surface. And I'm very excited about what that means for the church. I think this is true for all ages. It's a theme that's sort of developing from conversation to conversation. Not everyone, but a lot of them on the podcast, for those of you who listen to every episode, you'll notice like when the culture goes shallow, the church's move is to go deep. Yeah, when, totally. And I'm, I'm, I'm for you. I mean, we use AI. I use AI. We, we can talk about that if you want. AI is here. It's inevitable. It probably won't be contained. Um, and God is still sovereign. But I think we are the alternative to what the culture is missing. Is that what you're thinking when it comes yeah, to well, yeah, 100%. personal? Well, so, I mean, it's deep connections. Everyone's got yeah. sort of shallow connections, but all that's doing is really doing is producing, it's making us um, knowledgeable but not wise, connected but lonely. And um, I, I think this is a beautiful moment to say, we're here, we love you, and we've got space at the table. I think it's a beautiful moment. When you walk away from, and you said it took a few days to debrief from a Eugene Peterson visit, uh, and you said he had one foot in eternity and one foot in this world. I think John Ortberg said this about Dallas Willard, who he knew. Uh, I think I think this is either John or Dallas's wife who said, after he died, 
he might not even have known the difference because he was so heavenly minded. Like it might've taken him for a while to go, Oh, wait a minute. I'm dead. And and this seems an awful lot like my life. Right. Like, so good. yeah, it's really cool. I want to know what that did to you because there's a lot of us who would have loved to have been in that room. There were a handful of people. Um, What legacy impact did that leave? Well, I tell you the most, can I tell you the most shocking thing from that whole meeting? The most shocking thing from that meeting. Say it was a, it was a good group of young pastors who were there, many of whom you would know. And, uh, everyone's like, thank you, Eugene, for just pastoring 300 people. Thank you for keeping the church small. Thank you for just having the vision of being a shepherd. Thank you for not caring about size. And at some point, all of these accolades sort of shook him a little bit. And he said, very quiet, raspy voice. Hang on, do you think I kept the church at 300? I couldn't grow it past 300. That was my leadership limit. That wasn't a philosophy of ministry. That was the limit that God gave me. He said, the lady who came in after me was a way better leader and the church grew to 600. And it was like, it was interesting watching people who had sort of moralized a leadership limit or capacity as some deep, profound conviction. And it was just like, oh, really, really interesting. Um, what I loved, what, what I think happened in my heart was this sense, dear God, let me finish well. Mm. Let me finish well. It seems almost impossible to finish well these days. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the Christian magazines, another one of my mentors, just a guy that really impacted my philosophy of ministry, has just had an affair and been fired. Mm. And um, I just maybe want to finish well, maybe want to be godly, mm. maybe want to be kind and patient. It made me want to invest in younger leaders. It made me want to be strangely present. It made me want to talk about Jesus and poetry, you know, and to, to, to be a, a grateful man. It was really, it's really hard to explain the depth of his presence. You see, we talk about charisma. Charisma is four things, strength, warmth, intelligence, and energy. And as, as the world sort of defines it. So you get somebody strong, but they're warm, but they know a lot, and they got good energy. Like, wow, that's charismatic. He was so charismatic. And basically, he's just warm and kind. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It, it was, it, he had a weight to him. So it, really, I would describe it as an anointing. He had a sense of the presence of God, not like a Pentecostal, though he was Pentecostal in his early years. He was also a butcher, which I loved. Mm-hmm. But he, he, um, he had an anointing. He was under the shadow of the Almighty. And if you got near him, you could feel it. It was beautiful, man. It That's made what me John want to be Mark like that. said. Yeah. He said it was like being in the presence of Christ, which I think is one of the reasons I'm a little obsessed with people who are finishing well. Yes, and from yes. everything we know, Eugene finished well, Tim Keller finished yeah. well, and... Uh, many others, many of whom names we don't know. That's right. Have finished a lot of people well, doing it I, right. Yep. A lot of people doing it right. I want to meet more and more of them. Gordon yeah. McDonald is someone, you know, he had a yeah. mistake along the way, but a lot, anyone who knows him would say it was out of character and he is finishing extremely well. Well, the gift he gave us was how to recover. And a oh. lot of these folks do not seem like they're not recovering well. Rebuilding and, Your um, Broken World? Yeah. I Fantastic mean, book that gets forgotten yes, by yes, Gordon, yes. Gordon's yeah. people. Like, you know, yeah. or people who, who know of Gordon, they know of the story, but they don't know of the process he went through to finish well and live out his years. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, when you think about where the church is going and the greats we've lost, the women and men that we've lost over the years, um, Gordon's been on a few times. I've got to reach out to him again and just just reconnect. We haven't talked in a bit. But the number of people who DM me or text me after they hear one of his episodes, you know, particularly the first or the second one when he was on the show, The View from 80 yeah, or whatever. That was and he's so good. Oh, he talks about the spiritual father and like yeah. good friends who never cry call me weeping and yeah. text me saying, I just broke down and cried. Like it's just... We need more of that. So an encouragement to young leaders is if you can drink from that stream. And the last thing I'll say too, if you want to capture a little bit, have you seen the uh, YouTube series that Fuller put on with Bono and Eugene Peterson up the lake? I had seen, 
I the, I have seen that. Yes. Yeah. And is that, that like was, a similar vibe to what you guys? Okay. Had? So like, a, I think I sat at that table, man. I mean, I'm not exactly. I mean, exactly. I, it, 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 that's ex, it's, it was in his house. It was that house. No, it was in his house. And I mean, he's got the yeah. white Mister Coffee coffee maker, like no upscale <laughs> cappuccino machine, like, and and apparently, according to his biographer, because I've done those interviews too with yeah. Eric, his son, and his biographer on this show. Um, most of the money he made off of the message, he just quietly gave away to people totally. to fund their seminary education yep. or their doctoral studies and other causes that were close to his heart. And they lived a very simple life. Well, I think that his dad built that house and they just sort of maintained and added over the years. I mean, you go there yeah. and the thing you notice about it is the beauty of Montana, not the scale of the home. It's like what, what you're caught up in is Montana, which God yes. made. So it's, it's well-ordered. Yeah, so uh, we'll link to that in the show notes if anyone wants to see the vibe, but it was a very similar vibe. And and then, you know, the iconic story of Eugene is uh, Bono wanted to get a hold of him because he loved the message. And so it's like, Bono wants to invite you to a U2 show. And he goes, well, I don't know whether I have the time. And they're like, are you kidding? It's Bono. And he goes, yeah, but it's Ezekiel. Like he was in the middle of translating the Old Testament at the time. And he goes, no, you don't understand Bono. This is Ezekiel. That's that is a man in the second half of his life right there. Uh-huh, uh-huh, exactly. <laughs> so, oh man, it's such a great conversation. So let's talk about Gen Z. You said you're getting challenged as yeah. a preacher now. Um, there seems to be a breakdown in, I don't want know whether you'd call it decorum, but people just, I think because we're all used to having a microphone now, are totally. you finding, you know, and a phone where we can broadcast whatever, whenever, to whomever, do you find, how do you, what, what's happening there? What's the dynamic, I guess, is the question. Well, I, listen, I've got no complaint about it. It's, it's how a generation grows up. Um, so I'm not, I'm not upset or offended or how could they, anything, these are my kids' age, you know. Um, it'll just be things like, you know, I'll, I'll spend, I'll read, 15 books on a topic and put a hundred hours of read, like really thoughtful analysis on something and then speak on something and someone should say, you haven't thought this through. Like that, that's not even biblical. That's not even biblical. And then they'll, they'll quote, have you read that book? And I was like, oh yeah, I, I did read that one. You know, um, it's just sort of like, it's an assumption that you know nothing. It's in a, you know, rather than like, wow, I assume you've really thoughtfully prepared and carefully worked through this. And, you know, so it's a classic, um, you know, someone had just said, um, I can't wait for your church to rethink your sexual ethics. Mm. And I was like, hey, with all due respect, you think I haven't thought this through? (laughs) You think I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs? You think when you drop something that you saw on a YouTube video about, um, the word homosexual not being in the Bible. It, it, like the, I've never, oh my gosh, I've never heard that. I've never heard that. So again, I think there's, a, there's an assumption of your ignorance. Um, but the, 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 they're not saying that because they're ignorant. They're saying it because they've just learned it. And it's exciting mm-hmm. for them and they want to test that. They're saying that because they care about people and they're worried that people who are not thoughtful are holding on to positions that are harmful for others. So, you know, it's... um. Um, in secularism, there is no higher good than human flourishing. And so I think a lot of gen, the way secularism shows up in Gen Z is that the ultimate good is human flourishing. Mm. And so if somebody say, like, you're, you're harming someone with that idea, um, that's like the ultimate trump card. Your position does harm. And... Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, eudaimonia. This is like hu- human flourishing is the highest good of life and self-actualization is the point of existence. And um, it's, that's a lot better than hedonism, man. Mm-hmm. But it's just not the kingdom of Jesus. There's something above human flourishing, which is the glory of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And so I think, I, I, I don't think we've done a good enough job teaching Gen Z about the kingdom of God. If they're meant, to, listen, I'll say this, if, if they're meant to be seeking this first, we owe them to tell them what it is that they're meant to be seeking. And I do not feel like we have done that. I feel like we've shown them a shallow version of modern church. I think we've shown them um, sound bites. I just don't think they've had a beautiful theology. So part of like the great project of my life 
would be to talk about Jesus and the kingdom of God as the main mm. priority, just Jesus and the kingdom of God. Well, I was going to ask you, and this is a micro and a meta question, but the micro, when you're having that conversation, someone's like, hey, you just need to rethink your sexual ethic. Like, come on, man. Yeah. What do you say in the moment? And then second part, what will your long-term play be, which I think you just hinted at? Uh, what are, well, I mean, in many ways, um, I'll be very kind in the moment. Um, I'll be discerning in the moment. It depends on the situation, you know. Is this person coming? Is this a social media grab? I don't engage in social media, mate. Nothing good happens. Uh, no, oh, no you mean thought. if it happens online? Yeah, if it happens online, there's no no response. I mean, I say, hey, look, go back. I've taught on this. I did an hour and 20-minute talk on Jesus in the gay community. If you listen to that, I'm happy to engage on any point on it. Um, but if it's in person, I say, hey, yeah, hey, tell me. Uh, the, the number one thing I'm trying to do is not my opinion versus your opinion. The number one thing I'm trying to do is like, hey, how do you read these texts? Because my assumption is you want to follow Jesus because you're talking about Jesus in this. So how do you interpret these texts? Now, they may have not been used appropriately, but to dismiss them because people have been hurt by them is bad theology. You can't, we don't do that to any other issue. The Trinity's hurt people in cults. Therefore, we, um, we don't teach on the Trinity. These have become, you know. So again, but you can't weaponize verses. So I, I want to talk through the texts. How do you read Romans 1? What do you think Jesus meant by Matthew 19? And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I would way rather engage with someone who disagrees with me and has really thought it through than someone who agrees with me and hasn't done like deep work on this. You know, I'm not looking for it to, to rouse the fan base or to rally the, the base, you know. So yeah, I want to be pastoral, I want to be thoughtful. Um, and I want to understand where they're coming from. Hey, is this an issue you've wrestled with personally and you're trying to figure out if there's a place for you in our church? Do you have a friend you care about or family member? Um, I'm trying to discern where they're at. So, you know, when it comes to the long play, I think you're right. Everybody does have instantly formed opinions on almost everything. And some sometimes, you know, they're well thought through, sometimes not so much. But uh, what is the long play that you have for figuring out how to pastor a church and lead people through a time where the culture wars are going on and everybody has an opinion on everything, literally. Well, um, it would be, uh, you know, Gerald Sitz, who wrote Water from a Deep Well, and I think he wrote A Resilient Faith. He basically said, the key to the church's current moment is the second century Christians in the Roman Empire. And um, it's basically uh, generative suffering love. That's sort of the approach, man. Create the world you want to see. You will be persecuted for doing this. Do not get bitter. Suffer and love well. I think that's really my approach. I think my approach is really, um, I don't get to, I'm trying to inherit, I'm trying to be faithful to, to the deposit I've received. Um, I want to steward that well. I want to make it about Jesus and not Jesus and politics or Jesus and purely an ethical vision or Jesus and human flight. I want to talk about Jesus first. And then I want to build a beautiful community of people who model the way of Jesus in such a way that you ask, is this space at the table for me? You know, I've been thinking, I've been thinking so much about this one scene in the life of Jesus that is just so, it is so beautiful. I am fixated on it. Jesus is having a meal with a Pharisee and a sinful woman goes to the Pharisee's house, brings a bottle of perfume, anoints Jesus' feet, and then washes his feet with, a perf his feet with her perfume in hair. And the Pharisee says, if this man was a prophet, he would know who's touching him. And I, I just thought for a moment, who is Jesus that the most sexually shamed, outcasted person in a religious society is willing to endure the shame of going into the house of the Pharisee to be in the presence of a holy man who will show her grace. Mm -hmm. How did Jesus do that? That is what I want to do for the future. I want to offend Pharisees, welcome sinners, and still be a holy person that does not change my theology. And I, I think... 
the, gee, I mean, how did Jesus do that, man? That is it. The, the emotional field he created, the compassion, the kindness, the dignity. So to me, I've just, I've spent a lot of time, like how do we create a church where that happens? Mm. How do we create a church where we don't lower our standards? How do we create a church where people know what we believe? But our love is so strong. It's stronger than the love of the tax collector who will love you because you're like them. We will love you in your difference. That church has not been good at that. I don't know if I'm good at that, but I am resolved that the church should be like that. Yeah. I will see to, and feel free to disagree or have a totally different take, but what I'm sensing, seeing, is that some churches are finding growth or at least stability by saying, here's a very narrow line. This is what we believe on sexual sexuality. This is what we believe on racial justice. This is what we believe on economics, etc. This is what we believe about the second coming. Everybody here agree? Good. We're fine. There's another type of church that I see as growing and healthy that isn't necessarily you know far left or far right, um, but biblically centered, biblically anchored, faithful teaching, where the teaching is orthodox. But because it's such a curious mix of people in the church, there's a diversity of opinions on some of the key issues of the day. You will have people who vote left, uh, you know, and people who vote right. You will have people who maybe don't have a biblical worldview on what they believe sexuality should be, et cetera, et cetera. And so you got a diversity of belief, not, not necessarily about Jesus. I mean, there are people who are still exploring and checking that out but just who don't all fit this uniform grid and yet, you know, somehow they're coexisting. What do you see in that? I mean, I have, I have two immediate thoughts on it. Number one, um, that feels like uh, a very challenging long-term solution. Um, yeah. It probably works fine in the short term. You've got to have clarity on key issues. You know, I mean, I, th- I think you just do. That's how humans cohere. But then here is Jesus with a zealot and a tax collector, and they're both his disciples. And so Jesus yeah. somehow had a way to, to offend everybody's vision, elevate everybody's vision, surprise them with what it looks like to live in that uh, vision. And then the, the real risk was when he ascended in Pentecost. They're in the room and he's physically gone. And so the Holy Spirit comes and then they're baptized and Christ is in them and that same spirit is internal. Um, so I like that idea. Um, it, it, it all depends on what you consider, I, again, what are primary and secondary issues. I think you can have yes. disagreement on yeah. cultural issues. Um, I don't know if people in the modern world think you can have disagreement on cultural issues. You know, um, <laughs> yes, I, so just say in secularism, there are no secondary issues. There's only primary issues. And uh, the issues that we draw our morality and identity and our sense of worth from. So that makes it very, very challenging. Um, it is a messy time, man. It's a messy time because it is. there's so much ideology and so much failure of the church. And often the ideologies are addressing the failures of the church, but they're not the biblical solution to what the church would do. And so, you know, you do, you've lost the moral authority to sort of rage against the ideology because the people who don't believe what you think they should believe are sort of living the thing you should do better than you are. And that's a challenging environment. So again, the future is discipleship, mm-hmm. you know. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's so much. And, and, you know, I think there's a stat, I think Ryan Burge might've had this one. It could have been Barna. I don't know which, but people, if you're a parent of, uh, you know, a 20 something child, you would rather have the per- more people are comfortable with them marrying a non-Christian than someone who votes differently than they do. That sounds that sounds um, about right. Yeah, that's that sounds about right. But again, I mean that is that's because um, we 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 no longer have a sacred sense of identity formation. It's only cultural identity formation, and um, so that sounds right. I saw an interesting. John, what else are you seeing? Oh, this, uh, so, oh yeah, go ahead. No, I just saw an interesting uh, uh, a study that was done this morning. It was on shopping, and it said uh, how to tell which generation you're in based on this one question of your shopping preferences. You're at the checkout. Do you want to talk to a human to scan your goods, or do you want self checkout? And everybody above Gen Z wanted a human, and Gen Z said, if they took away self scanning, I would stop shopping there. Gen- and the the response was, I don't like the human interaction. Isn't that fascinating? 
What do you read into that? Uh, I just read that there's a generational difference. That's what I read. Anything else on the generations? Uh, you know, you're giving them a seat at your table. You are. Oh yeah, man. I got a young staff, man. I, I, I pastor a young church. Um, I am, yeah, 47. My wife's 45. We are regularly the oldest people in the room by a decade plus, regularly. And you know, I've got to say, I love it. I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm grateful. I do uh, want to just call forth in prayer, mothers and fathers, to come help us. But I, uh, I do love it. Um, I don't think I'm seeing anything a, a, a lot more than we've talked about. I, one one thing I've noted, you know, I'm always studying revival history. I read something about revival mm-hmm. every day. Um, most revivals, even if they had an older leader, saw breakthrough by handing it over to the next generation. And uh, so, I mean, you know, I mean, Evan Roberts is in his mid twenties leading the Welsh revival. And but the Welsh revival broke open because a teenage girl stood up and test, testified in a meeting, and I said there was a cloud over the nation of Wales, and when she testified, the rain started to fall. Um, even in the Hebrides revival, uh, Duncan Campbell, there was praying Donald, who was a teenage boy, and and Duncan Campbell in in meetings would would look at him and say, "I can't get a breakthrough in prayer, pray," and um, oh, that's definitely something I'm noticing is. Um, You've got to give Gen Z serious spiritual responsibility. And it's, it's, look at Jesus trusting his kingdom on earth to teenage fishermen. That's like, you've got to, you've got to give it over. My one observation I have is about retiring earlier. Now, look, I have no mm-hmm. plans to retire soon. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of energy, but it's about giving away, um, the emphasis and the influence more quickly. I one pattern my my best mate Darren Whitehead and I talk about. He was high, was number two, knows a ton of sort of people from that world. Is a lot of these guys that had spectacular failures. If they just let it go five years earlier, all they would be remembered for was once in a generation leaders. Something about grasping in those final years or scandals catching up to them and. I, I want to let it go earlier. I want to give it away and I want to be there to support. I don't want to bail. I want to be there to support from behind and offer wise counsel. But I do think we tend to leave it five years. So if you build a big church in the senior pastor's final years of legacy, here's my legacy. Those five years are often the very thing that the Gen Z leaders will have to spend breaking down before they can get back to zero, before they can do what God's doing now. Uh, uh, not always, but there's something in that that we should consider the older we get, you know. It is interesting. As someone who uh, passed the baton at 50, yeah. which almost everybody said was way too young. Now, I did keep a teaching role for yeah. another five years, that's, but that's gave wise. that three yeah. years yeah. ago. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I highly recommend it. I'm not saying everybody should go at 50. Mark Batterson told me, we went out for dinner shortly after. He's like, well, you know, the Levitical priests, they would retire at 50. Now, 50, 3,000, 4,000 years ago might be different than 50 today. But, you know, it, there, there was a study done a number of years ago. I know I, I linked to it on my blog that said one of the predictors of a moral failure is you stay in a position, this was corporate, mm. six months or longer than you should. Oh, that's like interesting. Six months. Like, that's, that's interesting. Insane. But what happens, you get bored, you get restless, the energy isn't there, you get frustrated because maybe you're not growing like you used to grow. Yeah. And then you get distracted. And when, you know, there's that haunting passage of David's life at the time that kings normally go to war, David was always at war. He wasn't yeah. at war. Yeah, He takes a nap. He's on the palace roof and we know what happens next. Yeah, And it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, there's a lot of wisdom uh, to that. And I think yeah, it was Pete, I'll, I'll Pete, just underscore that. Pete Scazzaro, I, I think this was him. Maybe it was Hybels. I can't remember. But they said there's three reasons why people stay too long. They haven't saved enough for retirement, so they need to keep working. They don't have a sense of identity beyond the task that many of these founding pastors have done for so long. And they don't have a ministry to go to next that feels meaningful. And so you've got to start building like the financial resources and the sort of the third act career that you're going to have. And then figuring out what it's like to be God's man at that age of your life or God's woman at that age of your life. And I think 
we should think a little bit more about that the older we get to. No, I agree. And I mean, I didn't have the financial security to step out of the role. So it was a bit of a, well, all right, here we go. Yeah. And it's worked out yeah. just fine. Yeah. It's fine. But I think there's an element of faith too, because if you wait until all the conditions are perfect, you probably yeah, t- waited too long. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's a good word. It's like two seasons too long. Uh, what else are you seeing on the church landscape that is really catching your attention or your heart, good or bad? Um, what I what I see is as good is um, the openness of Gen Z. I see that as a very hopeful thing. You know, I was at Asbury. I mean, it was just absolutely beautiful. I mean, oh gosh. That gave me a lot of hope, a lot of spiritual hunger. Uh, you know, the, the good news about secularism is that it's a, it's a failing story. Jesus and the kingdom of God have never looked better for an anxious, overwhelmed, and burdened generation. To have Jesus say, come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Learn from me. That's good news. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm excited about that. I'm interested in what technology does for discipleship. I obviously think there's a ton mm. of downsides, but it is a glorious moment for technology in the church, for discipleship in the church, to access, to learn and have our deep questions answered and all that sort of stuff. Very excited about that. Very excited about digital evangelism. Um, you remember that, uh, that, that study, I think it was called The Great Opportunity by the Pine Tots Foundation. They had a phrase in there that I've used, you know, I'm looking for a hundred digital Billy Grahams. You know, one kid on TikTok can get more than Billy Graham did his entire life preaching ministry. Really? We should, we, we need to leverage that. I was telling our team the other day, we need a budget where we literally have 10 creatives in a room doing digital evangelism all day, every day in the room next to us. Like that is a massive mission field. My vision is that kids are, teenagers are on the, the train going to school in New York City, having encounters with the Holy Spirit where Jesus comes through a TikTok video and they're arrested by the presence of God. I, be, I believe in that in the deepest part of my heart. The, uh, you know, uh, Luther, Luther, a uh, uh, failed monk marries a nun, took on the might of the Catholic Church with a printing press, and he did all right. So, I, again, <laughs> I, I want to leverage that. I'm so excited about that. I don't want to do it. It's not me. It's not like, hey, team, put me on TikTok. It's like, let's <laughs> let's help you figure out how to reach your generation. I'm very excited about that. That being said, I have two concerns at the same time. One is a lack of discernment. So much content, so little wisdom. Uh, n- n- ignorance of history and heresy. And so you get a lot of people, you know, I'm in a lot of prayer meetings where I just want to put my hand up and say, excuse me, that's 100% heretical. I don't mean even false teaching. I mean, that was condemned by the church fathers in the third century. That's like not biblical. And, um, and but then the whole room is like, can you give me an example of that? People who don't believe in the Trinity but don't know it, you know, uh, people people who don't believe in the Trinity, um, uh, assumed universalism. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Assumed un- universalism. Um, yeah, uh, uh, um, an aversion to the wrath of God. You can say it if someone says, "Oh Lord, please have mercy on them." They're under your judgment immediately. A love corrector is going to come in the next prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your great love. You know, it's like no one can just handle the fact that, you know, we rage against injustice, but we just cannot comprehend that God, who is the source of all justice, would do the same thing, you know? Um, So lack of discernment uh, is a concern. And, And here's an interesting one, though I'm very sympathetic to it, is an overemphasis on Sabbath. Uh, really? Yeah, I've got a. I've written about Sabbath. One of the the most popular talks yeah. I've ever given is called "Rest Must Resist Exhaustion." But Sabbath is in the context of a six day work week. I always tell people, like, you know, are you committed to like the biblical view of Sabbath? I'm like, do you work six days? I say, well, no, you've got an American view of work. Like, enjoy the five day weekend, but it's not biblical. Go to Israel. <laughs> enjoy the five you know, day go, weekend. Oh no, no, go go to Israel. And they're working six days a week because that's what the Bible says. I'm not advocating working six days a week. My simple point is um, 
I think the job market has changed so much and there's been so much confusion in our culture and so much exhaustion and so much legitimate trauma in our culture. People have lost their capacity to work hard and long or the church has not provided them a theology of work. So it's sort of a typical person is saying it like this. They, they wouldn't say these words, but the emphasis is like this. Oh, what a workaholic, secular, evil world we live in. We have to endure it all week. And then we have this wonderful gift of Sabbath. That's not biblical. Biblical is, mm. thank you, God, that you made me in your image, that you have given me gifts to build culture, repair the world, and cultivate beautiful things for your glory and the good of others. Please help me do this work for your joy. And then thank you that I get to reflect at the end of the week and rest with gratitude for what has happened. So Sabbath is not an escape from the curse of the work. It's a mechanism to enable you to do it for the glory of God and do it for the long term. And um, I, 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 I get sad because I don't want Gen Z to miss out on the beauty of finding a sense of call and doing it well and having a place in the world and blessing others because you're good at what you do and you, and, and you share it with others. So I think we need to recover a little bit of a theology of work. You know, that's really helpful because you're right. The theology of Sabbath can easily become an obsession with leisure, sort of this influencer lifestyle, right? Where you do have five-day weekends and four-day weekends. And I saw somebody posting recently, it was like, um, you know, if you really want extra time off, here are all the days to take off because they fall on long weekends. You only have to take four to get five days off. And I'm like, whoa, that's like, that's like really gaming the system. Like, Work is actually a gift of God, right? And without it, you listen to Arthur Brooks and other people like that, without work or a higher purpose, you know, you're kind of lost. It, it's 100%. Uh, we, when, when people are unemployed, they feel shame. When they're underemployed, they experience frustration. When they're employed, they feel dignity like I'm earning a living here. When they have a career, they have a sense of accomplishment. But when you have a vocation, you get a sense of divine favor. And that's what we need people to have. Like, what God, what have you made me to do in the world? We need a theology of creation and vocation to come back again. And, um, and, and with, with Gen Z being so creative, I'm like, I want to, I want to help them map that onto God's will for their lives and not make them think uh, that they have to escape it. You know, what I love about this conversation, if you rewound half an hour ago, it sounds like we're kind of pre-digital memory and all this stuff. And yet it's like, wouldn't it be great to have 10 Gen Z TikToking in a room and we're funding them and uh, they're being watched on the subway system as kids go to school Etc. rather than the 52-year-old senior pastor going, put me on TikTok, right? Which I'm not saying you shouldn't be on TikTok, but I love like it's it's a both and conversation, yeah, not yeah, an either yeah. or conversation, which is so helpful. Yeah. Um, hey, there's so much we didn't get to, and I want you to mention your new book called Fighting Shadows. Yeah. I love that you continue to write. Thank you for that. Um, what else is on your mind? What else is on your radar right now? You know, I basically try and if someone else is doing a great job, like if there's, you know, I just try and champion their thing. I'm not trying, I'm, I'm trying to sort of like solve problems and fill gaps a little bit. Um, one of the things I've really sort of fallen into, it feels like a divine assignment, is fatherhood and men's ministry. Yeah. And um, it just, it was not something I was looking for. I did this rite of passage journey with my son. It was like one of the most beautiful, life-changing experiences of my life. I wasn't really going to do anything with it. I had dinner with Pete Gregg. I'd just come back from walking the Camino 500 miles across Spain with my son. And he said, hey, man, that wasn't for you. You got to get that off your laptop. That was for a generation of kids. Like, you, you, you need to put that out there. So I did that. And, and that's probably had more favor than anything I've ever done. And that was a divine accident. And then I had so many dads reaching out saying, my dad never did this for me. Do you have anything for men? So, yeah, I've got this thing called The Primal Path. It's like a, right, a five-year rite of passage journey, proper deep discipleship to form adolescent boys into godly men. But then um, 
I've started this thing called Forming Men with uh, Jefferson Bethke. And this has another level of favor on it like anything I've seen. And it's a combination of like psychology, theology, spiritual formation, and like brotherhood and fatherhood. That's in a very rare combination. Yeah, you know, I tell people I'm not an alpha male. I'm a beta male. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever shot and killed an animal. I don't like killing stuff. I don't have a truck. I have a Honda. Um, do you know, you know what I mean? Like I'm not a, I'm not a. But yeah. I used to be a butcher, and I'm from a working class background, so I get those dynamics. But I'm a thoughtful, intellectual, urbanite. Um, and mm-hmm. and yet. This is just getting like a resonance and it's on male formation. I've got a conviction that gender matters. It's not just a social construct. It's a spiritual reality. It's, something, it's, a, it's a part of the grain of the universe and that men need spaces. Women need them too, but I think women have done better than men in the last 20 years. Mm. Men need spaces to be vulnerable, honest, and open, deal with their shame and failures, and then given a vision of how to move forward. And... Um, the ki- I am seeing such accelerated transformation in the lives of these men. I feel like I got, I, I'm almost struggling to know what to do with it. So we've got a nonprofit. Uh, we've got a bunch of um, curriculum coming out for men. And it's not like, there's a lot of good curriculum, but a lot of it's 20 years old. And the changes in mm-hmm. gender and culture and faith, it's almost like speaking a different language. Dramatic. So there's, core, there's definitely core themes. But for whatever reason, our language is like hitting a sciatic nerve in men's souls right now. So we wrote a book um, based on the seven core issues we see men wrestling with in the world today. And we just try and address it. Um, so they, that's what the book's about. It's called Fighting Shadows, right? Yeah, that's it's called Fighting Shadows. Jefferson. And it's, I'll give you the big idea of the book, okay? I'll give it to you in two minutes. Mm-hmm. Satan is always overplaying his hand. And there's a scene in when Jesus and Peter are talking where Jesus says, uh, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've returned, strengthen your brothers. That word fail in Greek's eclipse, it's where we get the word eclipse from. And here's Satan's strategy. He wants to eclipse God. He wants to put something between you and God so it looks like God has disappeared and all you are left with is the problem. And um, so Jesus says, I've prayed for you that that will not happen when the eclipse passes. Strengthen your brothers. And uh, I think Satan basically tries to show, you can stand and position your hand in such a way the sun disappears. The sun's not gone, but it looks like it. And Satan's strategy is to put things in front of the eyes of men where it seems like God disappears and all they have is their problems. So it's a book on the seven core issues we see men wrestling with in the modern world and then how to respond to them. Mm. What are, uh, just you don't have to name all seven, a couple of the top issues you see men struggling with? Uh, apathy is one of them. Like men, a lot of men just can't get traction in their souls. Um, on the other side, ungodly ambition. The ones who do can't get a governor on it. Um, obviously, last loneliness is a huge one. Male loneliness is at ep- loneliness is at epidemic proportions. But male loneliness, many Christian men feel like they do not have a group of men they can share their struggles with. They're, they're fully isolated. And uh, so just, yeah, helping men become friends again. Uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful opportunity. I'm getting a lot of joy working in that space. John, I got to tell you, these conversations are always fascinating. Thank you for just showing up your whole self, open book. Really appreciate it. And, you know, one of the goals I have for this show is if we were at dinner, what would the conversation be like? And I feel like mission accomplished. One hundred. It, it I have just, talked to you offline, and it's this. This is it. So it is. You are very good. It at is that. this. You're very good at that, and uh, I appreciate yeah. you uh, having me on the and podcast. I really like it because everyone read the talking points and they've read the books and that kind of stuff. But like to have the the real wrestling match of what do you see and what else do you see, and sometimes it's it's not 100% consistent and yet it's real and this is what we're all feeling and you bring that in spades thanks for doing the hard work thanks for spending two or three hours in the morning to get yourself together uh, because we're all benefiting from it thanks, in one way or another john yeah. really appreciate you my friend thanks cheers mate